I especially um, want to thank the Las Gatas people because we we think it's our story too, and are so happy to to be sharing everybody's part in the story, and all our museum faithful people that come, and and all of our other guests, school kids, college kids, and everything. So this is Tim Z. Hernandez, our guest, and. Um, Before I begin, I want to actually do the mo probably pro probably the most important thing. Is a, a big group selfie with everybody? Because <laughs> they don't believe that I came to Kalinga, you know. So, so here we go. Everybody's got to kind of squeeze in, okay? <laughs> Kalinga because since 2010 when I began this journey of searching for this story uh, this is the first town this is the first community I came to because I didn't know where to begin and I'm going to share with you today uh, some of the stories in this presentation of uh, everybody that I have come in contact with uh, well I wish I could share with everybody but almost everybody that I've come in contact with folks in this local community here that you'll know that a lot of you know and some of you might be related to uh, who have what I consider, uh, what I would call the story gatherers, or the story keepers. Um, also, another, another way to phrase that is the culture bearers, the people that have held on to these stories and have passed them on through oral history, right? From one mouth to the other ear. That's how we hear our stories. So this is very much, very much Kalinga's story, very much the story that belongs to Los Gatos Canyon in Central California, very much an American story also. So, you know, give yourselves a round of applause for that. It's really an honor to be here. Uh, I also brought with me a special uh, guest musician, Ana Saldana. Ana, would you stand up for us? Yes. Uh, she'll be playing a few songs, uh, obviously, along the lines of this theme. And then at the very end, we'll have a very nice, robust version of Deportees for everybody to hear the song playing like at Los Gatos, okay? <laughs> Which is her first time of performing that song here in the community where it happens, so that's also an honor. <laughs> um, to begin with, I actually want to acknowledge that, you know, that this story really is about uh, our ancestors. It's also a story about those who who lived before us, and like I said, have passed on since, who shared these stories with us. And if it weren't for if it weren't for those stories that, that get passed on, obviously I wouldn't be here. You know, I wouldn't have heard, you all wouldn't have heard those stories. And we continue to pass those stories on. So it's about, this is a story about the past, and it's about us here in the present. And obviously it's about how we pass these stories on to the future generation, okay? So, I want to say that uh, first and foremost. Let's begin. I have this uh, screen here <clears throat> that has lots of wonderful photos, probably some photos you've seen, some spots you recognize, and maybe, hopefully, some photos you haven't seen. But today I want to also uh, do a special honoring for my dear friend who has passed on since, uh, Julie Gaston, who is also a resident of the canyon. Some of you know her as well. And uh, her, her father was Happy Gaston, who was the bus driver for probably some of you up uh, in the canyon. Uh, Happy Gaston is right here. She was actually the first person who opened her arms to me in uh, you know, about 2011, I believe, maybe 2011. Uh, and started to say, I can take them to the canyon. I know exactly where the crash site was. I'll never forget it. You know, she took me up there. And she actually said, you know what you're going to do first is why don't you meet me at the McDonald's in town, and I'm going to invite a few of the old timers. That's what she said. She said, I'm going to invite a few of us old timers out there. And uh, that's what she said. That's, that's how she referred to everyone. <laughs> that's not what I'm calling you, but Judy said that. <laughs> and she invited some really um, kind folks up, a group of people who were up there. Uh, uh, Johnny Bass was, was one of them. Do you want to raise your hand? Uh, see you there. She was one of them. Well, who else was it? Who else was there with us in that first group? Anybody else here? Was it just you, Bass? Was there with us? A couple of other folks. Right, right. There was probably about three or four folks, and I came up here and we all met at McDonald's here and started telling you the story. Of what they remember. It was a very powerful moment. It was the first. It was the beginning of all of this. I wanted to know ultimately, you know, who were all the lives that that perished in this accident. Because this accident, it didn't just affect the people who were on that airplane, but it also affected the community, the community itself. My dad! 
stories of, of June's uh, younger sister, Nancy, <coughs> Nancy Gessler, who was actually a child at the time. And when the plane crashed, crashed down, the wing flew off and it was floating through the air, sort of like a feather, they said. And Nancy, uh, the family remembers that Nancy was a little girl, she was in the yard at the time, and she saw it. And she felt like it was this giant metal thing chasing her. So she would run one way, she said, and the wing would come this way. And she would run back the other way, and the wing would start to come back this way. And they said that that, that haunted her the rest of her life. That she was uh, frightened of airplanes or wouldn't get on an airplane. And Larry Haas, who, who wished he could be here also, was a good friend of mine too. That was his mother. And he said, yeah, we, we, had, to, we had to give her a lot of uh, alcohol to get her on an airplane. <laughs> and he said, my poor mother, you know. But, uh, but yeah, so this story lives on. You all are the living history of this story, and it's an honor for me for Anna to be here. I'm going to talk about the family. Um, so, just, uh, just, just as a recap, because I know we all know the story, but just as a recap, uh, I'm going to kind of give you some of that context, okay? On January 28, 1948, on this very day, 75 years ago, on this very day, 75 years ago, at 10.30 in the morning, <coughs> A, uh, well, let's go back actually to 9.30 in the morning. At 9.30 in the morning in Oakland, California, the United States government was set to send back 28 Mexicans from Oakland, California to the San Diego border. They were Bracero workers who were here on a work visa. Some of their work visas had expired, and now that the war was over, uh, long over since then, they, uh, they were starting to send the workers back to Mexico. And they started to do them by the Douglas DC-3 airplane because it was just a faster, easier way, and also because the war had a, a surplus of these airplanes, which we, they considered the workhorse of World War II, the Douglas DC-3s. Um, I consulted with a couple of pilots who still fly Douglas DC-3s to this day. And we talked a lot about that airplane. And they talked about how it was the workhorse of World War II. World War II couldn't have been fought without Douglas DC-3 airplanes. But we had so many of them afterward that they started to repurpose them. Give them a new paint job, put some seats inside of them, and use them to transport people. Um, and in this case, on this morning, it was to transport the Bracero workers back to Mexico. Well, after they left at 9.30 from Oakland, an hour into the flight, around 10.30ish, uh, that's when the pilot experienced smoke coming out of the left engine. Now, here's something you may not know. Is pilot Frank Atkinson, who was a decorated World War II hero, had his wife, Bobby Lillianne Atkinson, also in the airplane with him. She wasn't a stewardess professionally. But that morning he said, honey, they're going to pay us some extra money and also we're expecting. So why don't, we, uh, why don't you be a stewardess for us? Two weeks before that day, she was on the phone. Bobby Lillian Atkinson was on the phone with her sister-in-law out in Rochester, New York, and she told them, if anything were to ever happen to Frankie, I'd want to be with him. I'd want to be with him. And two weeks later she had that opportunity. You know, and uh, probably the most prophetic utterance of her life. And uh, sure enough, they, uh, they were, and, and pilot Frank Atkinson, like I said, he was so adept at this airplane that he had actually crash landed a Douglas DC-3, the same type of airplane, twice before, one time in the Himalayas on one engine alone, and he survived. There was no other pilot you would have wanted on that airplane except Frank Atkinson, right? He knew what to do. The pilots I consulted with told me what happens is that that airplane actually had kind of a, it was common for that airplane to, to the engine to smoke or to catch fire. So they actually built a firewall around that engine. So whenever an engine would catch fire, they could shut it down with these metal blocks basically, contain the fire, and still fly the airplane on one engine. So it was built to do that. Okay? So on this morning, before Frank Atkinson could go down his checklist of what to do, as the smoke came out, they started to call into the radio tower that the Kalinga airport was nearby. So Frank Atkinson started to actually aim the airplane a little bit more inland towards the San Joaquin Valley. In the final seconds before he had a chance to do anything else, the unthinkable happened. Not only did it catch fire, but somehow it burned through the firewall and torched off the left wing. I gave the accident reports to two pilots who have been very experienced in this airplane, and they looked at the accident reports and just kept scratching their heads saying, I don't know how this could happen. It's just a fire. It should have been contained. There's no way they could have torched it off. It could have torched off the wing. We just don't understand how that could have happened. But it did. And obviously the plane then came spiraling down into Los Gatos Canyon, <coughs> spilling people out. 
Eyewitnesses were Frank, uh, Frank, uh, Frank, Deputy Frank Johnson, who was there at the uh, road camp, what is now the Benito uh, Mining. Anybody here related to Frank Johnson, Deputy Frank Johnson? Raise your hand, sir. Raise your hand. Right. I love this. The living history is here. It's incredible. Uh, also, uh, 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 Warden Melvin Wilmer. He was the warden. He was the warden at the time. Uh, this is an aerial view of the crash. I know it's hard for some folks in the back to see it. I apologize for that. But when the plane crashed down, uh, oh, let me show you actually. Let me show you something else here. This is the warden standing on the wing that was out there in Los Catos Canyon, right behind the uh, ranch property of the Gaston Ranch, Happy Gaston's family. In fact, uh, they're here in this house here, and the wing was behind this house. You know, there was another house that they had. This was all their property up here. So behind that was where the wing was at, and that's where he's standing. Anybody recognize that spot? Raise your hand. Yeah. Recognize that spot. <laughs> I recognize that spot. <coughs> this is another photograph from the scene of the accident. It's a little bit blurry, but okay. So what happened next is really what brought us here. That's why we're here. What happened next was the. Um, well, actually, let me tell you what they said. All the reports said was that the way the plane crashed, it kind of spiraled, right? Because it had one wing off. It was spiraling now. And it actually took a nosedive into the canyon so that everybody was basically pushed through a sieve of metal and gears into a fiery grave that some of us have still probably witnessed at some point. You know, our family's witnessed. And all of the bodies were unidentifiable. Unidentifiable. And yet, somehow, the remains of Frank Atkinson and Bobby Lillian Atkinson were sent back to Rochester, New York, by train. The remains of co-pilot Marion Ewing were sent to Long Beach. And the remains of immigration officer Frank Chapman were sent to Berkeley. And if you do the math geographically, you'll know that Rochester, New York, is further away than Mexico City, than Aguas Calientes, than Charco de Pantoja, in Guanajuato, Rochester, New York is much, it's actually almost twice as far as any of those places I just named. And the remains of the Mexican passengers were pushed into an unmarked mass grave in Fresno's Holy Cross Cemetery, never to be heard from again. To add insult to injury, the newspaper reports, the initial reports, uh, mentioned the name of the American crew members, but didn't name the Mexican passengers, only referred to them as deportees. The Fresno Bee did make an attempt, actually, a couple of days later to, to publish a list of names, but the names were, I think there were about 12 or 13 names, but the names were also very erroneous, probably because they were going by the government, official government records, and the Bracero workers at the time, when they were coming across, they rarely ever signed their own names. They would tell the, the person typing, and so the person typing would hear the name phonetically and say, uh, if somebody said, my name is Marquez, they would say, oh, Marcus, and type in the word Marcus. So that's how the names became erroneous. Okay? So they, they attempted, though, Fresno, we did attempt to publish the names, but we didn't know who they were. Okay. Uh, well, obviously now, we have, uh, here's actually, here's a photograph of the uh, 28 caskets at Holy Cross Cemetery. All the people you see there, which were about a thousand that day, came from the Mexican-American community. They didn't know anybody who was dead. They just came to show the support. <clears throat> this is from the Associated Press. 32 are killed in California's plane crash. 28 Mexican deportees, crew, and guard victims in the coastal range disaster. Coastal range. <laughs> Maybe that, oh, I guess that is the coastal range. <laughs> and of course, you all know the famous song, This Land is Your Land, This Land is My Land. We all know that song from elementary school. Uh, who wrote that was Woody Guthrie. And Woody Guthrie was really big on names. He knew the inherent power of names, and he didn't like what he heard on the radio, because at that time, the radio broadcast echoed what the newspaper report said. The radio broadcast said 28 deportees, Frank Atkinson, Bobby Lillian Atkinson, Frank Chaffin, and Marion Ewing, and 28 deportees. Woody Guthrie was a, uh, there, there was, he was so big on names actually, there was a song in, uh, during World War II, what happened was they sunk this Navy battleship. 
um, and a hundred sailors were killed. The battleship was called the Good Reuben James. And a uh, hundred sailors were killed, 44 survived. And Woody Guthrie was waiting for the news reports, but somehow the media stayed hush about this incident. And so did the government at the time, and he didn't like that. So he actually wrote a song called The Good Reuben James, in which the song is literally just him for 20 minutes strumming the guitar and singing the names of every passenger, every sailor who was killed that day. Okay, so he knew the power of names. So by the time the accident happened, he didn't like that the folks uh, you know, who were the Mexican braceros who were here working didn't get their names. So he, had, he didn't know who they were, obviously, so he attempted to restore the dignity by assigning them fake names. He wrote a song, right? That's the song he writes. And what he writes in that song, in those lyrics, Goodbye to my Juan, goodbye Rosalita, adios mis amigos, Jesus y Maria. You won't have a name when you ride that big airplane. All they will call you will be deportees. Well, that song got picked up by Pete Seeger and pretty soon Joan Baez and Bob Dylan and Bruce Springsteen and Dolly Parton and Willie Nelson. <coughs> Lots of singers, um, pretty much everyone under the... And in fact, that song's been all over the world in different languages at this point. <coughs> I like to think that, uh, that if it weren't for the musicians, the singer-songwriters, I mean, how many of us just really turn to music in our own times of personal crisis, in our own times of maybe personal contemplation of things, and somehow a song just hits you just right, you know? Music has that power. It keeps the message alive. I like to think that those lyrics, who are these friends all scattered like dry leaves? The radio says they are just deportees. Who are these friends? All these musicians have been singing this song for 60 years before somebody, before the conditions were just right, the sun hits the, the earth at the right time, and you know, we get the vegetables to sprout up, all those conditions have to be right. That song hung in the air for 60 years until the son and the grandson of migrant farm workers born and raised here in the San Joaquin Valley decided, I want to answer that question, who are these friends? So that's the power of music. And with that, I'm going to invite Anna to just sing us a little song. Anna. Anna. probably annoyed some of you at some point. <laughs> I feel like that sometimes because, you know, I kind of was going around and just asking questions and people were going, who is this guy coming around here Los Gatos Canyon asking questions, you know? Uh, but, you know, many of you are so generous with, with the responses, you know, and, but I still couldn't find any real leads to, to you know, the families. I, I wasn't sure how to go about that. I'll have to say outright, I didn't go to school to study investigation or journalism or any of that kind of thing. I actually went to school to study poetry. So, I was just following my curiosity is really what I was doing. 
looking around, trying to follow my curiosity. And um, finally, I kind of gave up in early 2013. I just threw in the towel. I said, I don't, I don't know how to find any of these families. I don't know. You know, I'm sure they're probably in Mexico. I, I, don't, I have no clue how to start searching. So finally, I did uh, the only thing I thought to do. It was kind of a Hail Mary. Um, I called up a friend of mine, a newspaper uh, a journalist who worked for the only bilingual, well, the leading bilingual newspaper here in the San Joaquin Valley, Vida and El Valle. And so it's published in two languages, and it goes everywhere between Bakersfield and about Stockton or Sacramento area. My friend Juan Espada, and who's actually standing right there with a blue shirt. <laughs> He's here today, too. So I called him up, and I said, hey, Juan, I have this story you might be interested in publishing, and I could use your help. So I told him the story, and I said, I'm looking for families. And he says, you know, I'll do what I can, my friend. I'll do what I can, and we'll see. You know, the paper comes out. I don't know if any of you know this, but that newspaper comes out only weekly. It comes out. I don't know anymore, but back then it came out only weekly on Wednesdays. And so he published it. And it said, authors looking for families of the deportees. Anybody know anything? Let, you know, here's his number. And uh, so that week I got excited because I knew the paper was coming out on Wednesday. And I said, oh, great. This is awesome. I'm going to keep my... I'm going to keep all the bells and whistles on my phone happening, so and people are going to be calling me any minute now, you know. And uh, that week passed by, and Wednesday went by, and then that paper went off the shelf, and a new newspaper came in, and I said, oh, dang, now it's, it's not out there anymore. And then another week passed by, and nothing. And then a third week passed by, and by then I said, well, we gave it a shot, right? Well, around the almost fourth week, I get an email late one night as I'm researching, and the email says, Mr. Hernandez? My name is Jaime Ramirez, and I am the grandson and nephew of two of the passengers on that airplane. I just saw this newspaper article three weeks later after it came out. Let me know if you want to know anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I said, wow, this guy knows some things, you know? <laughs> so I, uh, I called him up and I said, uh, Mr. Ramirez, where are you located at? And he said, well, I'm here in Fresno. And I said, can I meet you? When can I meet you? And he said, uh, well, yeah, come to my restaurant. And I said, you have a restaurant? And then he said, yeah. And I said, where's your restaurant? And he said, it's on the corner of Shaw and Blackstone in Fresno. I said, now your restaurant wouldn't happen to be holy free holy, would it? And he said, yeah, that's my restaurant. You know it? And I said, I said, do you guys still have the soft serve for kids, all you can eat soft serve? And he said, yeah, my parents took me there since I was a kid. He says, well, that's my restaurant, come on. Talk about synchronicity, talk about being born into a place, you know, into a story that, that, that really belongs to you also. I, I said, I will be there. So I went to his restaurant on the very first meal. <laughs> so I go to his restaurant, and the whole way I'm actually thinking, I have about a thousand questions I have to ask him because as a writer, as an author, and as a scholar, you cannot just take someone's word for it. You have to prove they are. There has to be evidence that they are who they say they are. There has to be an evidence somehow, some tangible evidence, some material that connects him to the family that he claims he's a part of. He said that his grandfather was Guadalupe Ramirez Lara, one of the passengers, and that his, uh, that his uncle was Ramon Paredes Gonzalez, the other way around. His grandfather is Ramon and his uncle is Guadalupe. All right. And I said, okay, well, let's go see. So I show up, and I think I'm going to have all these questions for him. I'm going to ask him to have all these records, maybe, but, you know. I show up, and this is what I find. He's there with his brother, Guillermo. They're at the restaurant, and they have all these records splayed out across the table. <laughs> Photographs, death certificates, birth certificates, uh, newspaper art, everything. So I said, wow, that's Jaime Ramirez right there on this side. And that's his brother, Guillermo. And uh, down here is the photograph of his grandfather yeah. and the photograph of his uncle. And that's his, that's his grandfather's wife. That's his, that's his, uh, his grandmother. Yeah. So I said, well, all right, well, yeah. <laughs> okay. So we talked for about two hours. I'm leaving now. I'm leaving the restaurant, and I'm just kind of, my head is, my, I'm mind blown, as they say. I have all of these, uh, you know, these sort of pictures that he allowed me to take. And I'm getting ready to leave, and he says, Mr. Hernandez, hold on. Before you go, do you have a list of the names of the passengers? And I said, well, yeah, I do. It's, it's got a lot of errors on it. It's from the Fresno Hall of Records, you know. You can't rely on them, so, you know. <laughs> I said, I have a list of the names. But he says, okay, because I, I have a list, too. I don't know, would you want to take a look at it? Or... <laughs> <laughs> You have a list? You have a list? As fate would have it, this is the first family I would find. 
He says, yeah, let me show you the list I got. <clears throat> he pulls out this envelope. And from that envelope, like origami, he pulls out this old, sepia, tattered, stained newspaper. This big newspaper. And it's like, it's so thin, it's like onion skin, you know? <laughs> and it blows in the breeze. And he, he set it down on the table there, on the tabletop. And I look at it, and it's all in Spanish. And it's a Spanish independent newspaper called El Faro from 1948, published only in the Fresno County area. And I look at it, and it says on that newspaper, here is the list of names of all the dead Braceros killed in the plane crash. And it has the first, middle, and last name of every passenger killed on that airplane. And then, it also has the last known residence of every single passenger who was killed on that airplane. And then, not done yet, <laughs> and then it also has, and here are their, the list of their relatives and their, their family members' names also. I said to Ms. Ramirez, well, I don't have that list. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I've been saving it all these years. He had been doing the research on his, for his family and keeping the records of his family for all these years. And I said, what would make you think to keep that newspaper for so long? And he said, I've been waiting for you. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the, so the story continues. So his brother Guillermo, before I leave, his brother Guillermo says to me, hey Tim, if you're ever going to go into Mexico, <coughs> I'm going to go with you. If you're ever going to go look for the family, I'm coming with you. So, okay, okay, well, okay. So Guillermo, we'll do that, we'll do that. Okay, sure, we'll, we'll do that. Anyway, so Guillermo, one day, finally two years later, in 2015, I finally, I had done all the research I could in this area. My family, my mother and father still live in Visalia. You know, I was born in Dinuba, so I'm from this area. I come home all the time to my family, all the time. But every time I come home and visit, I do research here. But I had exhausted all the routes. I didn't know what else to find. Mr. Ramirez, I had his newspaper also in hand and tried to find families. But now I had to just go into Mexico. There's no other way around it. So I called up Guillermo and I said, hey, Guillermo, are you ready to go to Mexico? He says, yeah, when are we going? And I said, we're going to go in January, the anniversary of the plane crash. We're going to go in 2015 in January. He says, OK, let's go. And I said, all right, Guillermo. And he says, hey, listen, I have a couple questions for you. He says, uh, Every time you go around these communities I see, you always have uh, recording equipment and cameras and all that and hanging around you all the time. And he said, he said uh, are you going to take all that equipment to Mexico and walk around with all that? I said, well, yeah, i got to record and document all this. And he says, no, 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 listen, listen. I know a person there, a friend of our families, a young lady named Sandy Cano. She actually does camera work and video and all that. We can hire her, you know, and it would help, be helpful to her also. I said, you're right, you're right, Memo, let's hire Sandy Cano. So sure enough, we hire. And he says, hey, hey, by the way, by the way, how are we going to drive around? <laughs> no, okay, so yeah, we're, we're, getting, we're assembling the research team, okay? Anybody see that movie Ocean's Eleven? You know when you're getting a team together? That's kind of how it started to feel, a little bit like that, but there was only just a few of us, so it was less than 11. But anyway, uh, so, so Guillermo's talking to me on the phone, and he's saying, uh, you know, we can get a driver. And I said, okay, well, do you know a driver? He says, yeah, yeah, my father, my best friend. He's a driver. Actually, Tim, his job is to drive around all of central Mexico. He knows some of those roads and streets and all that stuff. He's a good driver. We can go in his Jeep. And, and I said, well, okay. He says, yeah, my, my, my compadre's name is Armando Raso. Armando, he's a good driver. We can, we, uh, you know, we'll pay him a little bit of money. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get Armando to drive. We'll get uh, Sandy to do the videography and videotaping. Uh, you'll help me with some of the translation, and then uh, we'll be set. So he says, all right. So I fly into, uh, in January of 2015, I fly into Leon, Guanajuato, because that's actually his, his family, Jaime Ramirez's family's uh, hometown there is uh, in Valle de Santiago, Guanajuato. The little town is called Charco de Pantoja. Charco is uh, like a lake. It's like a little puddle. 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 It's like a puddle. <laughs> yeah, it's not even a lake, it's a puddle. It's like a puddle. Yeah, it's a puddle. So I land in Leon, Guanajuato, and there's Mamo waiting for me. There he is. He's, he's waiting for me. 
at the airport, and I'm excited. So, hey, Bevel, how are you? Oh, it's so good to see you, my brother. Oh, it's so good to see you. We're going to do some good work for the next two weeks, traveling, finding families, knocking on doors. Okay, good. Well, we're going to do that. And he says, oh, and actually standing behind him, a ways behind him, uh, is uh, there's this guy who's about yay tall. He's got a big cowboy hat on. And he's got those flashy sunglasses. And he's got a toothpick hanging out of his mouth. Big old buckle. And he's just staring at me. And Guillermo says, hey, Tim, this is Armando. This is my compadre, Armando. He's our driver. <laughs> Armando, you shake Armando's hand. He's got the grip strength of a bull rider, you know. And uh, we go, all right. So we jump in the Jeep, and now we're taking off. He says, now we're going to go pick up Sandy. And he says to me, now, Tim, listen. Sandy's father is a little traditional, you know, so I'm going to have to have a conversation with him when we get off. You just stay, in the, just stay inside the car. But if I, if I tell you to come out, then you come out. Okay. We show up. We get out. Guillermo gets out of the car, he goes around, he starts talking to Sandy's father outside, and I'm just in the Jeep quiet, with all of our equipment there, just kind of quiet. And uh, I hear him, talk, I can kind of, we hear him whispering, he's talking, he's talking to Sandy's father. So, so then Guillermo looks at the Jeep, and I'm inside, he waves at me, and he goes, come on, come on, Tim, come on. Okay, so I get out of the Jeep, and I walk over there. Hi, Sandy's father is eyeballing me. And starts asking all the questions. Who's going? For how long are you going? Is she, is she going to be paid for this? Is, you know, we, we say, yes, yes, it's all going to be good. Okay. Then he says, okay. Sounds good. And then he yells for Sandy. Sandy! <laughs> Sandy comes out with all of her equipment and everything. She jumps in the Jeep. She's ready to go. All right, we're going. Now we're going. Okay. At the end of the road, the very end of the road, as the Jeep is driving up the road, there's this old man standing at the end of the road. And he's got another big hat on him like that, kind of cocked sideways. And he's holding his little backpack with items in it. And he's standing at the end of the road. And at that point, Guillermo looks back to me and he says, one more thing, Tim. <clears throat> my uncle, my tío Leobardo, he's like, he's like 80 something years old. He overheard us talking about this trip and he's going to go with it. He's not going to take no for an answer. <laughs> That's him over there waiting for us down the road. And he's waiting with his back, with his back back to clothes, waiting for us. So there we go. It's like I told you, it's the research team in Mexico. It's like Ocean's Eleven, but there's five of us. <laughs> That's the research team right here. Myself, Sandy, Guillermo, Don Leobardo, and Armando. That's the research team. And we start going around Mexico. Here's something kind of crazy, because there's a lot of synchronicities, alignments. I'm going to start sharing with you the stories of these families right now. Okay, I'm going to show you some of them. Here's something. So then, about two weeks before we actually take this trip, Guillermo says to me, you know, my daughter, she has a boyfriend whose last name is also Miranda, and they're from Jocotepec, Jalisco. And I saw on your list there's somebody named Luis Miranda Cuevas who was killed in a plane crash, and his family's from Jocotepec. And we believe that he might be related. So just for a minute of appreciation of what we're saying here is one of the descendants of the passengers through generations found their way to another descendant, one of the other passengers, all through time and, and history here, and they found their way to couple, to become partners, and they were young, up to 19, 20 years old, they were young, and they're together suddenly. So two of the descendants found, found each other, and it happened to be that he actually, the young man was related to Luis Miranda Cuevas in Jocotepec, Jalisco. What are the odds? So he gives us the number of, a, of an uncle, and his name's Pablo. Pablo Miranda, he works in Jocotepec, he works for the municipio's office. We call him, and Pablo says, yes, when you guys get here, contact, come to the office, to the municipio. The municipio's like the local mayor, the local government. Come to the office, ask for me, they'll call me down, and I'll come and I'll take you to my family, and you'll meet all of the family of the passenger, Luis Miranda. So we say, okay. So we show up to the municipio's office that day. We walk to the municipio's office. And uh, we asked for Pablo, and they said, he no longer works here. Mm -hmm. Well, he was, we just talked to him like two weeks ago. Sorry, he no longer works here. So, well, well, and I tell him, I'm like, let's tell him the story. Let's tell him the story. The plane crash of Gatos, it's a powerful story. Maybe they'll share the, what, how we can get a hold of him. We share the story. Yeah, sorry, we can't help you. <laughs> All right, so we start walking out of the town. And we just start walking around the community. I don't know what else to do at this point. Get him saying to me, should we just get going, Tim, to the next, uh, to the next town, uh, you know, look for the next family? It's no, 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 let's walk around a little bit. Let's follow our, what I like to think of as my, my grandmother's instinct, my abuelita's instinct, you know, just kind of following where the spirit guides you. 
if we walk around the town, there's a mural and it says, it's kind of like the R.C. Baker Museum's mural on the side there. It's just a beacon for anybody who wants to know about the community. And it says, Centro Cultural de Jocotepec, the Jocotepec Cultural Center. <coughs> so we walk into that cultural center, not knowing what we're going to find. Following my, my grandmother's instincts, sort of while going through, we walk into the doors, and then there's another beacon of light. It says Biblioteca inside of there, another room, the library. And you know the librarians, they're the ones who wear capes in our community. You know, they're the superheroes. They know everybody and everything in the community, the librarians. Thank God for the librarians. So I said, let's go in there, the librarian, she's going to know, or he's going to know. So we walk in, and the woman says, uh, can I help you, gentlemen? Can I help you? So we tell her the powerful story of the plane wreck at Los Gatos, you know? We tell her the story of what we're doing. She says, what's the name of the man you're looking for? Luis Miranda Cuevas. And she says, uh, hold on a second, let me make a phone call. It's on the phone. Okay, there's a woman named Irene Miranda. I'm going to tell you how to go talk to her. You're going to go to her place of work. And she gives us the directions, and we follow the directions, and she says, and when you get to this giant big metal door, you have to bang on this door really hard. Don't worry about it, don't worry, just, just, just bang on it hard, somebody will answer. So we go, and we bang, and we find the door, and we bang on that door really hard. Boom, boom, boom. It's a big metal door. And a little tiny latch opens up. Can I help you? <laughs> yeah, we're here to speak to Irene Miranda. They close it. And we're waiting. A few minutes later, they come in, they unlock the door. <laughs> they unlock the door, open it up. We go inside. Children are running everywhere. It's an elementary school. <laughs> oh, it's an elementary school. Okay. Yeah, Irene is the principal. So we go and we go into the principal's office and we sit down in those tiny kid chairs, you know, in the principal's office. <laughs> All of us. <laughs> Sitting down in those little kid chairs in the principal's office. And Irene says, you want to know about my uncle, Luis Miranda Cuevas? We said, you're, that's your uncle? She says, yes. And she starts, and you know, principal in elementary school also wear capes. <laughs> you know, they do. And she is multitasking. She's taking phone calls. She's telling us the story of her uncle. In the meantime, she's signing papers as people are coming in and out. She's calling her own relatives at the same time, saying, everybody, come, come. Come to the office. Come to my office. They're, they're asking about our uncle, Luis. So by the time she's done, the whole office is filled with their relatives. And they're all telling us these stories of Luis. Okay. I get ready for this one. So at the end of it, so she says, so, Mr. Hernandez, the thing is, is that this is all secondhand information, just passed on to us by our families, as we all know stories get passed on to us. She says, none of us were alive when Luis was alive, so we didn't, we, we didn't know him personally. These are just stories we heard. So I asked from my little kitchen, is there anybody <laughs> alive who might, might have known him? No, sorry, Mr. Hernandez, that generation was gone. But then a whisper in the back of the, the cousins, what? Arturo, what? What, Arturo? So they all huddle up. <laughs> they come back. Well, Arturo says that Casimira is alive. I said, who's Casimira? But first of all, I got to tell you, this is, this is, I'm going to just give me, like, permit me, like, 30 seconds to geek out on this real quickly. But and Casimira is a beautiful name. It's an interesting name in and of itself. And as a writer <coughs> for this story, you want somebody to be named Casimira. <laughs> because Casimira is, the translation is almost sees. Casi, Mira, almost sees. And I was like, isn't that how all of our memory works? Like, we kind of almost see it, but we quite don't sometimes. Casi, I, anyways, yeah, okay. So that, after I, I said, Casi, Mira, that's a wonderful name. Who is Casi, Mira? They said, well, that was Luis's fiance. They were going to be married. And she's alive? Arturo, she's not alive. Arturo said, yes, she is. She is alive. That's my, that's my aunt. She is alive. Arturo, no, she passed away. She's, no, no, no. Everybody, get in my van. I'll take you to Casa. I'll take you to Casa. <laughs> so we all get in the van. And now we're driving to Ocean's Five. We're, we're going in the van and we're, we're going to, uh, to Casimira's house. And we get there and it's a beautiful, tiny little quaint house with bougainvillea flowers all over and draped everywhere. And Arturo jumps out of the car. He says, you guys wait out here. I'm going to go see if she's, if she's okay to have visitors. He goes inside. comes back out. She's there, she's there, everybody, come on in, come on in, come inside, come inside, come inside. We get inside, he's really enthusiastic, he's, he's excited about this, right? So we go inside the house, and <clears throat> out from one of the doors, comes a 80, maybe 85, 86-year-old Casimira in a wheelchair. 
she wheels herself out into the living room. She's wearing a little beanie. She's kind of cold. And Arturo says, she says, what do you want, Arturo? Who are these people? And he says, Tia, Tia, you won't believe what these, what these folks keep asked you about, Tia. You will not believe this. They want to know about one of your friends, Tia. I was a good friend of yours, Tia, a very good friend of yours. They want to know about, they want to, she says, Arturo, just tell me, what are you? <laughs> and, he, and he says, they want to know about Luis. And before he finishes the name, she says, the one that died in the plane crash? Oh, oh I don't know. Oh. That's the one, you have to tell them the stories. Tell them the stories. So we all sit down in Casimira's house, and she begins to tell us the story of Luis Miranda Cuevas. And she says, the only thing I can tell you is that Luis was an adventurous, adventurous young man. He would do anything we would ask of him. I, would, I mean, you know, I would ask him to sew with me, embroider with me, and he would do it. And you know, you know my father hated Luis. He hated him. He forbade me to be with Luis. So I told Luis, if you want to see me, you have to dress like a woman. <laughs> and he did it. He would dress up with a wig and a dress, and he would come to my house, and all my sisters and I would sit outside at the bench, and Luis would sit with us dressed as a woman, and we would sew, pretend to sew and embroider, and we would talk to each other that way. He would dress like a woman just to see me. <laughs> That's Casimira. <laughs> That's her nephew, Arturo. Who's the other guy? Oh, who's that guy? There's always one in the audience. Right? <laughs> and there's, you know, our team, Ocean's 11. I mean, Ocean's 4. <laughs> anyway, so, 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 and then she says to me, she says, you know, I spoke with him the day before he died. He called me from the detention center in San Francisco, and he said, Casi Mira, they're sending us back, back to Mexico. And I remember thinking, I thought there was a lot of them, because the way he said it, they're sending us, it sounded like there were a lot of them. And I said to him, Luis, I'm sorry, I'm sorry they're sending you back. And he said, no, 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 I'm ready. I'm ready. I, I saved all the money. He'd been working on strawberries in Watsonville. I saved all the money. Casimira, I'm coming back because I'm going to ask you to marry me when I get back. And, and I'm going to bring you a mariachi. I'm going to ask you to marry me. I'm bringing, me, I'm bringing a mariachi with me. She said, okay, Luis. Okay, I'll see you. Okay. He hangs up with her. She said, that's the last time I talked to him. Mm. Mm. The next day, she said, me and my sisters would always go hang out at the corner store because they had the only radio that was blasting music. And it seemed like we'd heard music from all over the world. We would just stand there in the corner listening to music. It was at the store that Luis's brother, Antonio, worked at. Luis's brother was there at the store. He played the radio, and the girls would come over and hang out. And we were there listening at the corner store and, uh, to the radio, and it said, a news bulletin. There's been a tragic accident. An airplane deporting 28 Mexican Bracero workers was crashed down in California and everybody was killed. And then the radio said, here are the list, here are the names of the passengers. And the radio started to recite the names. And she said, and I something told me, I knew, I knew something told me Luis was going to be in that. So we all sat together, huddled around the radio and listened. And we said all the names. And then they said, Luis Miranda Cuevas. And she said, you know, something happens to me when I feel really sad. I, don't, I can't explain it, but I started to laugh. And I just started to laugh when I heard that. And I couldn't stop laughing. And I sat on the curb right outside. That store is still there to this day. I sat on that curb right there and just laughed and laughed and laughed. And I couldn't understand why. My sister thought I was going crazy. And I said to her, Casimira, if Luis had returned, brought you a mariachi, what song would you have wanted to hear? And she said, oh, without hesitation, she said,
duration of the chorus is, um, uh, I have to play it a little bit. Mexico, lindo, beautiful Mexico, uh, beloved Mexico. Mexico, lindo y querido, si muero lejos de ti. If I pass far from home, far from you. If I die. If I die. Que que estoy dormido. Tell them that I'm sleeping so that I may be brought home to you. Uh, yeah, let them know that I'm asleep, but I can come home, basically. Yeah. If I die over here, tell them I'm sleeping, so yeah. I can bring you back to you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Another round of applause. So, um, I wish I could share with you, you know, first I have to say, it's as she was singing and I'm watching you all, it's an honor to celebrate the 75th hour, to honor, to commemorate, I should say. Uh, the 75th anniversary of the plane crash at Los Gatos. Uh, you know, it really is an honor to be here with you all today. I wish I could, I wish I could share with you the, uh, all of the wonderful families that I've been in contact with since then. I can't because we'd be here all day. But I will, I will share with you an overview of some of the families so, I can, so you can see some of who they are. Um, <clears throat> this was passenger Jose Sanchez Valdivia. His little brother, Celio, we've, uh, we found him in San, he lives in San Diego half the time. The other half the time he lives in her hometown of La Estancia in Nochisland, Zacatecas. That's where he was from. He was the oldest brother. So his brother Celio said, I don't have too many memories of my brother because he left to the United States when, he was, you know, when, he, when I was really young. And I stayed back with my mom. But I can tell you this, he said, everybody knew my brother for playing baseball. He said, in fact, that's the only reason my brother went to work as a bracero. And my dad convinced him, you have to come and help us. And, and Jose said, well, that's the land of Babe Ruth. I want to play pro baseball. And so, yeah, I'll go work with you, Dad. I'll go work in the, you know. His dad wanted him to work in the fields, but he was thinking of another kind of field, you know, baseball field. And in fact, he went on to be one of the first baseball players, what is now known as the Stockton Mexican League. It's still, a lot, it's still around to this day, the Mexican League of Baseball. And it was founded in Stockton, and he was one of the first baseball players to play in that league. Killed in the plane crash at Los Gatos. This is uh, Alberto Ragosa Carlos. <clears throat> they call him, his family calls him Betito. He was the youngest passenger killed at the plane wreck at Los Gatos. He was 18 years old. He's holding his niece, who he was really close to. I got close to my niece. He was holding his niece, Ophelia. Ophelia is that woman holding the picture. That's her today. <clears throat> and that's her family. <clears throat> and here next to Ophelia is a woman named Elvira Perwan. And Elvira, on that day, when we all had a, a, a nice family dinner together, they invited me over for dinner in Mexico City. That was in Mexico City. Elvira said, I was the girlfriend of Alberto. And he's the one, he was an artist. He used to paint and make ceramics and sell it to the tourists. And he, taught, he also embroidered. In fact, she said, he's, he taught me how to embroider. So Alberto was very crafty. This is passenger Frank Duran Llamas. <clears throat> and uh, Francisco Duran Llamas, I should say. But his uncle, his family calls him Frank, or they call him Pancho also. That's how they refer to him. Francisco Duran Llamas, actually they believe that he might have been an American citizen because his father was born in Kansas. His father is from Kansas. His mother was from Mexico, but his father left him at an early age, and he was raised in Mexico all of his life. But later on in life, actually towards the latter part of his life, he went to Kansas. They believe, the family believes he went looking for his father in Kansas. So he came as a bracero and went to Kansas to find his father. They don't know if he ever found his father, they just know. In fact, they have suspicions. They say, you know, we think he kind of looks like another famous guy. <laughs> uh, I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> Walt Disney. But here's the thing, Walt Disney was from Kansas. And Walt Disney was in Mexico in the 30s and 40s. <laughs> uh, this is passenger Rosalio Padilla Estrada. He was also killed in the plane wreck. And his family only, he's actually the most recent family that uh, has located me. His family's in Bakersfield. And his name is uh, Luis Estrada Padilla, and that was his grandfather. He wanted to be here today, but he said, at that time I'm actually going back to Mexico to visit my family relatives. My relatives, so I'll be in Jalisco during that time. I'm so sorry I won't be there, otherwise he would have been here. 
So I haven't learned too much about him yet, but we're in the process because he just found me a few months ago. This is, the, this is the family of the passenger Apolonio Placencia Ramirez. He's not picked, because this was taken a few years after the plane crash. His family got together, all of his siblings, and they all took a family photo together. Uh, I like to think that these empty shoes down here are a representation of his absence. But this is his family there. His family, one of his family members was with us last night. We did this presentation in Los Angeles, and she was with us there. <clears throat> now, this is probably this next one, and this is the last one I'm going to share with you. She, she was the only female passenger who was killed on the airplane. The female Mexican passenger, I should say, because there was Bobby also the stewardess. As far as the Mexican passengers, Maria <coughs> Rodriguez Santana. She was the only female Mexican passenger. And all the newspapers reported that the Mexican woman had blue baby clothes next to her. And there was no baby found, there was no baby ever found in the canyon. But there was these blue baby clothes, and that to me was a big mystery. I thought, I want to know more about, in fact, she was the first one I went looking for, because I thought it will be easier to find a woman amongst all the men. And I pretty much gave up on her right at the beginning, because after a couple of years, I couldn't find anything. It turned out later on in 2018, 2018 was a pretty special year. In 2018, uh, I got an email, and it said, Mr. Hernandez, my name is Mike Rodriguez, Jr. I heard about your project on the radio, and my aunt was Maria. If you need to know anything, let me know. <laughs> Just like I'm and he had been doing research. He's an inner city school teacher in Orange County, California. He teaches uh, history and ethnic studies. And he said, I know about my aunt. Now, he also said after a few conversations, my family knows who those blue baby clothes were for, by the way. I said, who were the blue baby clothes for? He said, they're for my dad, Mike Rodriguez Sr. Mike Rodriguez was the only it was the oldest baby of the family at that time. He was living with my grandma in Tijuana. So when Maria was going, being deported back, she was taking back her nephew some baby clothes. So Mike Rodriguez, junior, a senior now, whenever he's with us, like last night he was with us, he always wears these blue clothes all the time in honor of his aunt. So another special thing now, as we wind down here, and we're going to do a little Q&A afterwards if anybody wants to ask questions. Another special thing that happened in 2018 was that the California State Senate contacted me and they said we would like to publicly acknowledge the plane crash at Los Gatos. That had never happened before in, in the history of this accident. And he said, uh, why don't you come on down to, uh, to Sacramento and uh, we'll do a formal recognition there. So I invited Mr. Ramirez along, and his wife Lilia, and, and uh, some of the families of the, of the passengers. And, uh, on January, January of 2018, we were all there at the Senate floor, and they did a public recognition. And they told, the, they told about the accident, and they also, they also uh, talked about my book, and about the families of Los Gatos Canyon, the community of Kalinga was all mentioned here at this, at this uh, event. The singer Joan Baez was also there with us, you can barely kind of see her there, because she sang that song, and she showed up there too, and uh, to honor that. Now something pretty interesting happened at this event that we didn't expect. <clears throat> Here's a Senator Mani. There's one of the family members with uh, Francisco Duran Llamas, who's uh, Walt Disney, <laughs> and uh, Joan Baez. <clears throat> and there's my son down there, Salvador. And that's my hand on him. And that's my dad giving the politician a stink eye. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, so my son has been to these presentations since he was two years old. And my son is now 14 years old. He's grown up knowing his dad has been searching for the plane right to Los Gatos. My son has been to all these presentations. So on that day, they're reading the names of the passengers, all the passengers, out loud there on the Senate floor. And the senators are sitting down and, you know, being uh, respectful and everyone's sitting down listening to the names. And after every name is recited, my son, in front of me, starts to whisper something. He starts to whisper these words. He starts to say, Presente. Another name. He says, Presente. He's saying, Presente. And I said, I kind of nudge my son, like, Shh, not here, son, not here. And yet, the senator turns back to my son and he says, Louder. So my son starts to say, How about that, Dad? <laughs> he doesn't say that, but he starts to say, Presente, after every name. And it gets louder, it grows. Presente. 
That means present. It's an invocation. It's commonly known in Latin America also, in all parts of Latin America, different parts of the world. When a fallen comrade or fallen friend is, is, is gone and they recite their names, the community says back, they are present with us today. Just like all of our ancestors are present here with us today. Presente. And so it starts to grow. And pretty soon the senators are saying presente, and they start to stand up. And the entire room is saying presente after every name. You can actually find that video on YouTube. It's still there. The Senate floor. <clears throat> Afterwards, Joan Baez went up to me and she said, Was that your son, Salvador, who was saying Presente? Well, yeah, she says, I want to take a picture with him. <laughs> I said, Can I get in there too? <laughs> <clears throat> so, I'd like to uh, end the formal part of this presentation with the recitation of the names. It was always important for us, for me personally anyway, to include the names of all 32 passengers, not just the 28 Mexican passengers. Because this plane wreck at Los Gatos has so much to teach us. It's a, it's a beautiful metaphor and an analogy that we are all in one ship together, hurling toward a common fate that none of us are going to escape from. All of us are in this together. And so I felt, in fact, when the church, uh, the Fresno Diocese said, you know, I went to them and I said, we should put a headstone there where there was no headstone for 70 years. They said, yeah, and I said, and all 32 names need to be on that headstone. Even though Frank Atkinson, his wife, uh, the American crew members, all have their headstones in their respective communities, they should also be on this headstone because they were killed and they were affected by this piece of history as well. You know, an erasure to any part, an omission to any part of community or society is, is never good. And the church said, absolutely, the Fresno Diocese said, yeah, absolutely, that's the, that's the service here we provide. We put names on headstones. And I said, okay. And then they put 32 leaves around the headstone for the song, Who Are These Friends, All Scattered Like Dry Leaves. So uh, it's important for me always to recite all the names. But I'm going to include a few more names today, okay? So we're going to do this together. Y'all ready? Ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hyman, will you do me the honor of coming on up here and reciting the names with me? Come on, Hyman. I'm this on him right now, so he's not prepared. <laughs> <laughs> you do all the names that are involved. <laughs> Miguel Alvarez Negrete. <laughs> Tomás Aviña de García. <laughs> Francisco Durán Llamas. Presente. Santiago Elizondo García. Presente. Rosalío Estrada Padilla. Presente. Tomás Márquez Padilla. Presente. Bernabé García López. Presente. Sandoval Hernández Sandoval. Presente. Salvador. Severo Medina Lara. Presente. Elías Macías Trujillo. Presente. José Macías Rodríguez. Presente. Luis Medina López. Presente. Manuel Merino Calderón. Presente. Luis Miranda Cuevas. Presente. Martín Navarro Razo. Presente. Ramón Paredes González. Presente. Guadalupe Ramírez Lara. Presente. Román Ochoa Ochoa. Presente. Baldomero Torres Marcos. Presente. Ignacio Navarro Pérez. Presente. Alberto Raigosa Carlos. Presente. Apolonio Plasencia Ramírez. Presente. Mar María Rodríguez Santana. Presente. Guadalupe Rodríguez. Presente. Uh, Wenceslao Flores. Presente. Juan Ruiz Valenzuela. Presente. Jesús Santos Mesa. Presente. José Sánchez Valdivia. Presente. Bobby Atkinson. Presente. Frank Atkinson. Presente. Marion Ewing. Presente. Frank Chaplin. Presente. Presente. Let's get louder, y'all. Here we go. Woody Guthrie. Presente. Happy Gaston. Presente. June Lee Gaston. Presente. Deputy Frank Johnson. Presente. 
Dolores Crabtree. Presente. Bill Hallowell. Presente. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. do a Q&A. This was actually what the, uh, what the headstone looked like in 2010 when I found it there. And it just says uh, 28 Mexican nationals killed in, in a plane crash in 1948. This is what it looked like after we put the new headstone in. This was on uh, Labor Day of 2013. You can visit that today at Holy Cross Cemetery in Fresno. And you recognize this spot. That's the canyon. That tree is no longer there. Uh, but the families, the families that took them out there, this was in 2013 also actually, the day before the headstone memorial. I took the families all out to the canyon. One of the special moments was that I have a photograph of a, this gentleman here to the far left there is Billy Atkinson. He's the nephew of the pilot. He looks identical to his uncle, Frank Atkinson, the pilot. And he's got his arm around Guadalupe Ramirez, who is also, you know, uh, was killed in the accident. That's Guadalupe there. That's, that's Guadalupe. And he, this is... His namesake, that's it was his uncle, Guadalupe, so it's Guadalupe, right? So it was kind of nice to see the pilot's uh, descendant there with uh, Okay. He lives in the East Coast? Yeah, he lives actually in Colorado. Oh. So now the moment you've all been waiting for, I give you deportee plane wreck at Los Capos. Oh. Ana Saldana. <laughs>
that's not a joke. But um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I'm going to take a few questions. In fact, I'm going to invite my friend, my compadre, mi hermano, Jaime Ramirez, to come on up here with me. Come on up. And also, we'd like to find you. Yeah, well, you know, I think you can get up on it. Uh, yeah, I know. He's not going to come to these anymore. He's always making me get up and get out uh, any questions at all from the audience? Any questions at all? Yes? What uh, was the altitude that the plane was in the day? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. They, I, but you know what? Just the eyewitness of the port, they were saying around 5,000 feet. Oh, just, just yeah. Clearing it. Just clearing it, yeah. It was just clearing it. It was puttering for a while. Uh, the smoke was coming out of it. And then they all looked up, and then there was an explosion. Yeah. What did they do with the, the remains of the earth? I don't know. That's probably better to ask the community what the rem happened to the remains of the airplane. I don't know. I heard that some parts were left up there in the, in the Locatos Creek area for quite some time, for years. Yeah, and obviously we have the propeller right here too, so <laughs> that's the propeller of the airplane. Yeah, you didn't know that. Let me show you all. Yeah. This is the propeller from the airplane, from the actual DC-3. It crashed down in Locatos Canyon. This is the only thing that's left of it. It's pretty heavy. Johnny? I miss says he's never seen us before. He didn't know that. Does anybody know anything about it? What happened to the remains of the plane? Anybody have any of that story? Well, I remember seeing the burnout seats. You did? Yeah. That was um, and this part, part, little part, I, I couldn't have been, I don't know if it was in Right, yeah. So it's it's nice. They were still up there, but yeah. most of the plane was gone. Yeah. And, and just, just little things you saw. Up there. Right. Uh, let me take another question and we'll come back. Okay, we'll come back. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, you're collecting the information, you continue to collect information, stories, you know, wonderful stories. Of, and uh, your books are in the public, so are you thinking of a sequel or, or <laughs> Getting ahead of the game. He asked me if there's a sequel to my book. I actually just finished writing it. Yeah, there's a sequel. Because since 2017, when my first book came out, All They Will Call You, I found six more families. Some of them I shared with you. But uh, I actually had thought I was done. I said, I'm done. Mr. Ramirez is happy. I'm done. You know, and uh, but but what happens is, you know, the story kept uh, calling me back, so uh, families were finding me, and I'd hear their story, and I would find myself saying, often on the telephone, I wish you had found me a year ago, I could have put your story in that book. And then all these stories were so incredible that I started to, in fact, I found the family, too, of the immigration officer and spoke with them. That was important, too, and I thought, man, I wish I could have known all these stories before. And uh, it was just like, okay, God, I hear you. I'm supposed to write another book. So I wrote it. Uh, and uh, it's not published yet. It hasn't even found a publisher yet, but I'm working on that right now. Yeah, so there's, there is a part two. What's the title? <laughs> Mom! <laughs> said we wouldn't talk about that. <laughs> the title, I'll tell you, the title is They Call You Back. They Call You Back. See, that's why I like the title. <laughs> they Call You Back, yeah. How about it, let's make it a movie? Well, let's, let's talk, let's get the next question, sir. <laughs> Tim, as a frequent visitor to Orly Frivole, uh, I've seen the mural many times. What's the story behind the mural? Like, who created that? The artist is Ramiro Martinez, who did the mural there. Uh, and yeah, that was because Mr. Ramirez was there, and, and I said, hey, we should, uh, there should be something here. Because he says, sometimes people come into the restaurant and ask me about it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, all the time. Yeah. All so the time. people go in there and ask them because they want to meet the families, and then, I said, well, it would be nice to just point to something and say, well, there's my relatives right there. And so it was kind of a visual thing. And he loved the idea, so we did it, yeah. So I just gave your name and shook in Google and he did there. <laughs> you had a question, Matt. Yeah, I'd like to ask Mr. Ramirez from his side, here, his, his side of the story and, and, and how his family uh, came, came to know all about it and the reaction from the family, I should say. Reaction oh, to this. To this? Yeah. Oh, they were so excited that I, I found the, the grave. My grandpa, uh, that was Guadalupe's brother, always asked us when we were here in the United States to look for him. Mm -hmm. And we 
had no idea where to stop. But uh, one time I heard on the radio, I mean, uh, I saw on the maps, uh, uh, Cordillera del Diablo, the Diablo Range. And I remember my grandma used to say that the plane crashed in Cordillera del Diablo. So that gave me an idea to go to Fresno uh, on the records. And, the, and I, I went and looked through there. Because at that time, they give you the big books for the year. And I found uh, I found both of them. They gave me a certificate. A couple of years later, uh, I went to the library to find more details. Because all we have just <coughs> is that the plane, uh, the people were jumping off the plane, and they were still alive. That's what we wanted. There is a sort of a family uh, a rumor also, they said that, that they grew up hearing that when Guadalupe was dead, somebody had approached him and said to him, you know, and he, that he told him my name was Guadalupe Ramirez Lara, like he was alive enough to say that. Well, that was uh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah that, that was what they heard. And of course, we don't, you know, I mean, there's, it probably is unlikely, is unlikely that that happened, but that's what some of the stories that they grew up with hearing. You know? So, when I, my grandpa, he was, the, he was so happy that I found him. And he, he told me, now I can go in peace. I can go in peace because I know where my brother is. I know where I, through you. I, that's all I needed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yes, No, I've been looking for all 32 families, trying to locate them and get their stories. And so far, of all the 32 passengers, uh, I've located 13. No, I, I'm sorry, no, 16. 16. All. Well, it's been at a rate for about, well, the book, you mean, the, when is the book going to be finished? Because they have the genealogy and all that. Yeah, yeah. Well, the book is done already. I just have to find a publisher. When will I be finished until I find every passenger, everybody who's <coughs> killed in a plane crash? So far, it's been a rate of one person a year because I've been working on this for 13 years since 2010. So I got about 15 more years. <laughs> yeah. Do the math. I don't know. I'm a creative writing major, not math. <laughs> what? 25? <laughs> Another question. Yes. It's a little different question, but did the airline ever take any responsibility over all these years, or? No, the airline did not take responsibility. There's actually what I, from what I read in the newspapers, and I did the research on this. Uh, the airlines actually, and the United States government, took no responsibility. They said all responsibility, the government said all responsibility goes over to the airlines. And then the airlines said, we're not responsible either. And in fact, the airlines were taken to court. And there's a, there's at the Berkeley Daily Gazette, there's a newspaper article in which they, the, the reporter covers the, the uh, whatever the case was, the, the trial that was happening. And in there they said that, uh, that the, that the co-pilot, Marion Ewing's wife, was in the courtroom, and she said in the courtroom, I happen to know that there were 39 passengers in that airplane, not 32. It was overloaded, and that's what killed my husband. She said that in the courtroom. But of course, nothing ever came of it. I don't, or at least that I, don't, that I know of. And um, what happened was about three months after the plane crash, that airline's company dissolved its business. Six months later, opened under a new name. That's just stuff, though, that I've learned from the newspaper reports and information. That, yeah. Have you had any discussions with uh, media types about the ethics of their coverage of the original?